This next section of the workshop is going to focus on uh, going through the data that we're going to be using in the tutorial over the next uh, five days. Um, so the data that we are going to be working with is derived from a paper that was recently published um, uh, uh, as a co uh, compilation of data from many different studies. Um, the first author of that paper, Chen Liao, is in the control room with us right now and is going to be helping out with this workshop. Um, and so if some questions come up about this data, um, we can uh, pose those to Chen at the end of this session, um, or we can come back to those um, at the end of the day today. Um, we're very lucky to have Chen with us for the whole day today. Um, so now what's a very exciting about this data set, like I said, is that it compiles data from tens of different studies um, that were focused on hematopoietic cell transplantation. Um, in general, these are uh, longitudinal samples, meaning that we have multiple samples from the same subject over time. Um, and this is becoming um, increasingly common and increasingly important in microbiome studies. Um, I'm picking up some background noise on my mic. Can everybody make sure they're muted? Thank you. Um, and so now the primary repository um, for this data, there's actually two repositories for this data um, that we end up pulling from. Um, the first is um, FigShare, and that's um, what I have displayed in this slide up on the screen. And you could navigate to this by following the link that I have at the bottom of this slide. The other repository that this data is, uh, or, um, is, is stored in is the NCBI Sequence Read Archive. Now, let me just spend a moment and discuss why some of the data is in one resource and some of the data is in another resource. Um, so the full data set itself is composed of over tw uh, 12,000 samples and 550 million 16S rRNA sequences. Um, so that raw sequence data is stored in the NCBI uh, short read or sequence read archive. The data that is derived from that, and which is typically what users are focused on when they're doing their analysis. Um, so for example, the feature table, um, sample metadata, um, sequences associated with Amplicon sequence variants, all of that is stored in the uh, FigShare data set. Um, now the sequence data itself is very large in size, as you would imagine for 550 million rRNA sequences. Um, and the NCBI sequence read archive is specifically designed to be a long-term archival repository for that quantity of sequence data. Um, it's a little bit big for FigShare, um, and uh, so the author chose to put the what we would call the downstream um, analysis artifacts in FigShare. Um, whoops, sorry, wrong way. Um, and so the tutorial that we run over the next few days um, is going to be divided into two segments. Um, and so you should um, have uh, maybe already come across the link for the tutorial. Um, could one of the co-instructors please um, bump that link up in the Zulip chat right now so that everybody can pull it up if they're um, interested? Um, and so when you pull that link up, um, you'll see if you look on the sidebar on the left side um, that there is a uh, section of that tutorial that's called the upstream tutorial, and there's a section that's called the downstream tutorial. The upstream is going to cover importing raw paired end DNA sequencing data into Chen2 and performing quality control and rejoining on those data. The focus of that tutorial is going to be on 41 samples from this study, and uh, the end result from the downstream tutorial is going to be a Chine 2 feature table, which tallies the frequency of each Amplicon sequence variant that was observed in each of those 41 samples. Now, we are focusing only on 41 samples for that upstream section of the tutorial, because um, these are some of the most computationally expensive steps in a Chime 2 analysis workflow. 
Um, and so if we tried to run this, say on all 12,000 samples, this would um, probably run for the rest of the week on this server, uh, maybe even longer. And so we wouldn't really be able to do that on the time scale that we have for this workshop. Um, so instead we focus that in. However, we, when we do our downstream analyses, so when we start looking at things like ordination plots and the taxonomic composition of our samples, it's helpful to have more samples so that we can perform more powerful analyses. And so we will, um, in the downstream section of the tutorial, we will begin with the feature table and the Amplicon sequence variant sequences that were provided in that FigShare repository for all 12,546 samples. We'll then do some filtering of a feature table so that we can illustrate to you how you would do filtering um, of feature tables and sequences. And then we're going to focus it in on one single intervention study um, that is uh, included in that data set. Um, that study is um, the one that was published by Tar et al. in 2018. Um, I have the, um, the PubMed Central um, record for that paper up on the screen. Um, and so this will be the focus of the downstream steps of the tutorial. Um, and again, the reason we split this um, upstream is um, more computationally expensive and slower. Um, so we do it on fewer samples, but then in order to do a more interesting and exciting analysis downstream, we'll work with uh, many more samples. Um, so this paper that we're going to be focused on for the analysis um, is called Reconstitution of the Gut Microbiota of Antibiotic-Treated Patients by Autologous Fecal Microbiota Transplant. And this was published in Science Translational Medicine in 2018. Um, and so let's spend a few minutes talking about um, the, uh, what exactly was covered in this study. Um, this was also one of the papers that we had provided as recommended readings. And so um, if you have some downtime tonight and you haven't read this paper yet, um, I would highly recommend reading one. I think this is of the five papers that we provided. Um, this will be the most useful um, for you to understand as we go through our workshop this week. Um, so the focus of this paper is on allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, and you will see us abbreviate that in a few ways um, throughout the slides and throughout the rest of the week. Um, so you may see us refer to it as LOHSCT. Um, you may refer to, we may refer to it as HSCT. Um, and in some of the metadata that we'll be working with later, we refer to it simply as HCT. So those are all referring to the same thing. Um, and so this is an extremely invasive, um, but sometimes curative treatment for a variety of cancers and other diseases. Um, and so uh, in patients who are undergoing this um, treatment protocol, aggressive chemotherapy is performed, um, which destroys damaged um, bone marrow cells. Stem cells from a donor are then infused to replace the bone marrow. Um, and they are infused. Um, and then when they engraft in, um, in the bone, uh, in, uh, inside the bones of the recipients, they will begin creating new blood cells, ideally. Um, and so I mentioned this is extremely invasive. So before the treatment begins, um, the patient undergoes um, chemotherapy and antibiotics. Um, and so the chemotherapy is what destroys the damaged bone marrow and then the antibiotics. Um, a very uh, extreme regime is applied um, because this individual's immune system is um, essentially non-functional at this point when their bone marrow um, has been disrupted. Um, however, a side effect of this um, is that the gut microbiome is severely altered um, by this treatment protocol. Um, and prior work has shown that patients who lose microbiome richness during the treatment have higher rates of transplant-related death. Um, and so the, um, just to give an idea of um, what happens with the gut microbiome during this treatment, 
Um, in this slide, um, you can see um, a few plots that uh, are focused around the day relative to the stem cell infusion. And so that is time zero um, in these studies, or sorry, in these plots. Um, and so what you can see in panel A um, is that the individual under uh, uh, receives multiple doses um, per day of antibiotics around time zero, um, mostly just before and just after. Um, but these may be happening um, 20 days or more before and 100 days or more after the treatment. Um, in panel B, you can see that this treatment is associated with a decreased richness of the microbiome. Um, and so what that means, we'll spend a little bit of time on later in the workshop, but briefly, um, that there are fewer types of microorganisms in the gut um, during and after treatment than there were before treatment. Um, uh, yeah, and like I said, we'll talk about richness in, in more detail later in the workshop. Um, now, the plot on the bottom is again showing their diversity or richness over time um, and uh, is also adding in the um, fraction of the patients who have their, um, who uh, have engrafted. And so, in other words, where the are in the bone marrow and are now creating new blood cells. Um, and so, there's an important distinction that I want to make here between infusion and engraftment um, that is just important for interpreting results over the next um, few days. So infusion is the medical procedure um, where the stem cells are infused into the individual. And so that happens at a defined point. Now, engraftment is a patient's response to that infusion. And so that does not happen at a fixed time um, post-infusion, um, but typically is happening um, in this window of about 10 days to 25 days um, post-infusion. Um, and so for that reason, um, we, um, well, yeah, let me come back to that in the next slide. Um, and so the treatment that was studied um, in this paper is autologous fecal microbiota transplant, or auto-FMT. Um, so fecal microbiota transplant refers to, tran refer, uh, excuse me, refers to the transplant of gut microbiota from a donor into a recipient. And the goal here is that the donor microbiome um, stably establishes in the recipient's gut. Um, so in auto-FMT, the donor and the recipient are the same individual. And so, for example, um, and what was done in this study is that the donor material is collected before the medical treatment. And so before the individual starts receiving antibiotics and chemotherapy, um, that is stored and banked in a freezer. And then it is administered after the treatment with the goal of restoring that individual's pretreatment microbiome. Um, the idea for, um, or the motivation for using auto FMT in this study was that because these individuals um, have uh, had such extreme alterations to their immune system, um, that auto FMT might be less risky um, because it may reduce the um, possibility that an individual would encounter microbes that they had not previously encountered. Um, if they were receiving FMT from another individual, and so if they were receiving a heterologous FMT. Um, and so in this study, the auto-FMT was evaluated as an approach to restore the pretreatment microbiome in patients undergoing LOHSCT. Um, this was done in a phase two clinical trial. If you want to learn more about the trial, I have that linked here. Um, but briefly, 25 patients um, who were receiving LOHSCT were randomized to either an auto FMT treatment group or a control group. And so they were either going to get the auto FMT treatment 
or they were not going to. Um, and the auto FMT treatment um, happened uh, about eight to 27 days after the LOHSCT with a median of 18 days. Um, and so um, specifically, this was happening after microbiome or uh, sorry, after stem cell engraftment. Um, and so remember I said that engraftment is the patient's response. And though, so that was happening anywhere from between say 10 to 20 days afterwards, the auto FMT happens after engraftment occurs. And so um, the auto FMT does not happen a fixed amount of time after the HCT treatment, um, but rather variable depending on when those stem cells engraft. Um, and this study did illustrate successful reconstitution of the gut microbiota following auto FMT. And so in the tutorial that we're gonna be working through, we are gonna go through everything from importing and doing quality control on the 16S ribosomal RNA data that was generated for this study, um, all the way through doing analyses that are going to allow us to see the changes in the microbiome in the auto FMT treatment versus control groups, and even in tracking longitudinally how the microbiome is changing across these individuals. Um, and so, um, Briefly, I just want to show you some of the data from one of the patients in this subject. Um, and this is from that Tar et al. paper. Um, and so the first panel, panel A, is showing the uh, treatment regime. Uh, and so this is showing um, when the individuals are, uh, or when this individual is receiving what specific medications. Um, now, all of this information about when and which medications each patient is receiving is available in that FigShare repository. Um, and so we won't be doing a lot, say, with specific antibiotics in here, but one of the really powerful things about this data set is there's a lot more um, below the surface of what we are going to get to in this workshop. And so, for example, um, if you want to do some exploration of, um, of microbiome changes associated with specific antibiotics, um, you could find that type of information and a lot of other information in the FigShare repository. Um, and so panel B is showing the, the patient's neutrophil count um, along this time series. And so you can see um, that at day zero, when they get the infusion, the neutrophil count is effectively at zero. And then engraftment is defined as the point where they are consistently um, producing neutrophils. Um, the FMT happens just after that, as illustrated in um, panel C. Um, and so you can see these are taxonomic bar plots that are showing the individual's initial microbiome composition, um, the microbiome composition through the treatment. And so you can see very, very clearly here, like around day 21 and around day 30, that their microbiome richness appears to be very low relative to um, the beginning of the study. Um, and very uneven. Um, so it seems to be dominated um, by one particular um, group of organisms here, um, the Enterococcus. Um, and that after the engraftment, um, it appears that their microbiome looks much more similar pre-treatment, or sorry, to their pre-treatment microbiome than it does to their post-treatment pre-FMT microbiome. Um, and so we will be doing some analyses um, this week where we um, look at this trajectory across all of the individuals in the study and compare the treatment versus the control groups. Um, the two plots on the bottom are similar to some of the analyses that we will be doing. And so for example, this is showing the change in diversity um, post FMT and this is showing that they have um, restored um, most of their pre-treatment microbiome post-FMT. 
Um, and so very interesting work. And um, like I said, lots of cool stuff that we can do and that we will do over the course of the week with this data set. Um, and so with that, um, we will next jump into starting to talk about metadata um, and then uh, specifically looking at the metadata for this study with some of the first Chime 2 commands that we're going to be working with. Um, but before we get to that, I think we have um, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, if anybody has any questions about this study or about this specific metadata or uh, uh, this study or this specific data set. 